Hey church, you know, what a privilege it is for me just to take a couple minutes today to uh, share about what's going on this weekend at the church while Sue and I are away. Uh, we have the privilege to be in Romania to do some training over the next 10 days and would love to know that uh, you're praying for us. But while we're away, uh, Ray Kaprowski is going to be preaching here at York Region this weekend. And I am so excited that he will be here to open the word. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Ray. Ray and his wife Natalie and their four kids are on a journey that we are trusting is going to lead to them uh, becoming church planters with Harvest in Ottawa. But Ray's story with us goes back a ways. Back in the early days of our church in this building, uh, Ray and his wife Natalie attended here and um, responding to uh, God's working in his life, uh, I had the privilege to baptize Ray here in this church. And as they grew, they became small group leaders. As a matter of fact, Ray and Natalie were Susan, my small group leaders for a period of time. Uh, God gave them uh, two wonderful children, twins, while they were here as well. Uh, they now have four kids, and I'm sure you'll probably meet them um, over the weekend. Hey, while Ray was uh, on the journey, God took him from here, and uh, he went to a church up in Collingwood, and then down in the London area, back and served on staff in Brampton, and then really sensed the calling of God uh, to become a church planter. And uh, so we need to be praying for him and encouraging him and trusting God to do a great work as they prepare for this part of their lives. Um, it's the next step for them, but we have the opportunity to hear from them this weekend. Something you'll learn about Ray is uh, he's a passionate man. He's passionate about prayer. He's passionate about the word. He's passionate about everything. And so as he comes today to open the word of God, why don't you give him a great welcome back to his church, Harvest Bible Chapel, York Region. Well, praise the Lord. So thankful to be here with you this morning, church. And uh, I was saying to my wife Natalie and some of the elders today and leaders in prayer, just there's so much nostalgia coming back here and knowing there's a baptized just a few feet away from here and the precious memories we've had at Harvest York Region here and how the Lord has used this church so mightily in the life of myself and the life of my family. And so it was a great privilege to get the call from uh, Pastor Paul to come and share God's word with you this morning. Who's fit for these things? Amen? Who's fit for these things? But by the grace of God. And so we wanted to share a bit of an update of what God has been doing in our lives and through Harvest Bible Fellowship as he continues to build his church, fulfill his promise that he has said for his glory. And we're going to give you a little snapshot here. This uh, was our last vision night a week ago in Ottawa. And that picture, you have to know the background of this, that picture um, back in August when we had our first prayer night was 17 people big. And now, God is stirring hearts. God is mobilizing these people. There's people from Quebec in that core group. There's people from all over Ottawa, hours away, coming to be a part of that because God is stirring a hunger. Amen. And we believe the best days of his church are ahead. And we will see even greater things than these as uh, God continues to fulfill that promise. So that's an answer to so many prayers that many of you have been praying for. And uh, please keep that up. We need prayer. Uh, without prayer, we're dead. Without prayer, we're dead. Prayer is the furnace that keeps things running. And so uh, please keep us in prayer. They're much needed, much appreciated. And Lord willing, we look forward to giving you more updates as the Lord continues to lead, God willing, for a launch this fall in our nation's capital, okay? And we'd love to have you guys come down and share in what the Lord is doing. Well, we also want to share from God's word this morning. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25 is our text for today. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. The title of this morning's message is, God Knows. God knows, and I would ask that you would stand with me to uh, honor the word of the Lord and to read it together. Exodus 2, 23 to 25. God hears Israel's groaning. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, 
with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Let's pray. Father, it is overwhelming to think that you are a God who sees us right now and knows us so deeply, so intimately. Lord, you know the struggles we've had this morning in getting to church. You know the struggles and trials that we've gone through this week. You know the ones that are to come in the week ahead. You see us and you know us. God, you know the hurt that we are carrying in here today, the pain that we are struggling with, the confusion that we have in our hearts and minds. You see and you know. And so right now I pray we would leave those at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. And God, you would come and meet with us. Meet with us as we call out to you and we humble ourselves before you in this place. Father, would you be with my mouth? I pray every word that is spoken would be in accordance with your mighty word. Father, faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and would your spirit move here in power. May this be a place of freedom in Jesus Christ today. And Lord, unite our hearts with yours so deeply. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask for these things. Church, if you agree, say amen. Amen, amen, you may be seated. You may be seated. Well, a little background to this text that we're looking at right now. The Israelites here uh, have been in slavery in Egypt for 430 years up to this point. Let me just reiterate that, 430 years. And here we find them crying out for a savior and calling out to God to rescue them and deliver them from the brutal hands of the Egyptians. And the, the Egyptian hands were very brutal. They were brutal taskmasters and 430 years of this ongoing. And it is here at one of Israel's darkest hours up to this point that we see three crucial truths that we must remember when we are engaged in the trials, persecution, and struggles that we are facing each day. We have to remember three crucial truths. First off, when I'm in the trial, I must remember that God knows my cry. I must call out to him. God knows my cry. I must call out to him. Look at verse 23. It says says this. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. See, the many days there in the first part of 23, the many days that are being spoken of here were the 40 years that Moses, who was God's chosen man to lead Israel out of slavery, had been, in living, had been living in Midian for. He had had to flee Egypt. Moses used to live in Egypt. He had to flee out of Egypt to the land of Midian because of killing an Egyptian soldier who was beating a Hebrew slave. Okay, and so honor was held very, very seriously in an Egyptian culture. And so if you killed an Egyptian soldier, your life was always going to be on the line. Okay, you didn't have long to live. So Moses flees, and you see there where it says in 23, uh, the the king of Egypt died. See, the reason the king of Egypt dying is important is that this was the pharaoh or the king that wanted to kill Moses for what he'd done. He knew what Moses had done. He had it out for him. And now he's gone. And God is now opening the door for Moses to return to Egypt because God is ultimately going to use him to deliver his people from slavery. Significant. And notice there in the back half of verse 23 where it says, the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. See, don't forget, again, up until this point, the people of Israel had been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. We have to get our minds around that. And notice the word there, the term there, cried out. The Hebrew there, for Crito. Don't try to spell this, but it's Weyeda. 
Wayeda, which isn't some passing, flippant, uh, yeah, God, you know what? Uh, we're having a hard day here today. You just hook a brother up with some refreshment, please. That's not what we're talking about. The Hebrew there for cried out in Wayeda means to weep aloud or to howl. To weep aloud, to cry out or to howl. They were crying out to God to save and deliver them from the slavery of the Egyptians. And I love how, I love how this verse ends there. Do you see that where it says in the last part of 23, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, which means it was lifted up to God. God saw and God heard. It was lifted. He was attentive to it. And so we have to live in the text. It's very important. We live in the text right here. Picture what is going on here. Can't you hear? Can you hear the people of Israel weeping aloud, crying out to the Lord, saying, How long, O Lord? How long? Can't you see? Can't you see what's happening here? Can't you see the pain we're under? Can't you see the persecution that we face every day? Can't you see the oppression that's coming on us? I mean, have you forgot about us? Have you forgot? Don't you know how hard it is to go through this? I mean, why aren't you answering? What, what else do you want from us? What else do we have to do to get out from under this? Are you even listening? God, can you even hear? Can you even hear? Do some of those questions sound familiar to you and me this morning? You see, loved ones, I wonder how many of us here today are wondering the same thing as we go through the struggle, trial, or sin that we're facing and we feel is enslaving us. Some examples that came to mind this week were, how about in our marriages with our spouses? Lord, don't you see? Don't you see how often we're fighting? Lord, don't you see the conflict? Don't you see the oppression? Don't you see the unforgiveness? How long? How long does this go on? When, how long does the fighting have to continue? The stone silence. How about for those of us here who have children who may have walked away from the faith and you've been crying out saying, God, how long do I have to pray for my, my child? Can't you hear me calling out to you for them? They're still walking away. It's been years. Do you hear? Are you listening? Will you respond? Will you act? How about if you're like me with parenting, feeling so defeated as a parent, saying, God, I don't know what I'm doing, and you've given me four boys. And I have no idea how to parent them. I need your help. And every time I try something, it feels like I'm setting them back. I'm beat down. I've been impatient again. I've lost my temper again. Sound familiar? What about for some of us here, the physical or emotional hurt or pain that you are going through? Lord, can't you see the sickness is crippling me? Can't you see? Can you hear? How often have I cried out for healing? It's not coming. Are you listening? I'm in pain. What about the emotional pain? How about the persecution, Lord, that you know I'm going to face when I go into the office tomorrow? How about the emotional pain that I've suffered in the past? Can't you heal it? Are you listening? What about the addiction the fear, anxiety, or worry that's constantly coming at you and you feel like it's enslaving you, the fear of men that always rears its head, the anxiety and the worry and the doubt that just seems to paralyze you. God, can't you take these away? I can't do it. And the crucial question we must ask ourselves in times like this is this, loved ones. Who or what are you crying out to in that place of trial or suffering? That's where everything starts. Who or what are you crying out to in that place of trial or suffering? And hear this this morning. If we are not crying out to God, if we are not crying out to God 
then we can never be crying out to anything else that will bring us deliverance, peace, and security and hope that we're after. There's nothing else that can give it. Where else are we going to go? Where else can we go if not the Lord himself? And too often we end up crying out not to the Lord, but to our anger for our relief. If I just get angry enough, the person's going to back off, or this situation's going to be relieved. If I just get impatient enough, they'll see how frustrated I am and back off. And we start putting our hope in these things, in our finances. If I just have a, one more deposit in my bank account, then I'll have comfort and I'll be able to relieve the financial pressure that I'm feeling right now. Or maybe I'll cry out to others because God doesn't appear to be listening. And I'll seek their advice. Or I just want to run from the situation I'm facing because I, I need to be comfortable. I have to restore the comfort. And you know, as you're sitting there right now, just, just take a moment to write down what is it you're crying out to in that struggle that you find yourself going back to? Seriously, take a note on your sermon note and just write it down right now. We'll just give you a moment. Ask the Lord to show you, and he will. What are you crying out to that's not him when you're faced with those trials and those struggles? Just take a moment to write it down. We'll come back to it. My question here is, The last time you cried out to any of these things in that trial, did it, did it ultimately give you this lasting security, comfort, or peace that you were looking for? Did it? Did having that next deposit go in your account, did that give you the lasting, is that still holding you through right now? Because if these things really do deliver, why do we have to keep doing them again and again and again to try to relieve it if they're supposed to last? They can't do it. Only God can. And you see, a misdirected cry leads only to us heaping unrealistic expectations of lasting fulfillment upon people or things that only God himself can fulfill. That's the only place it can go. Unrealistic expectations of deliverance. And, and I wonder how many, it just got me thinking, loved ones, how many marriages could be changed if spouses would turn their hearts to God instead of turning them in anger on one another? And, and would the fear, anxiety, anger, and impatience have such a prominent place in our lives? It doesn't have to. I mean, how many addictions would be broken by the power of God if we would stop crying out to them to deliver us from what we feel enslaved to? How many could be broken by the power of the gospel? And whatever place you find yourself in this morning, I want to encourage you with this. God always hears when we call. Write that down. God always hears when we call out to him. And you say, well, wait a second. That's just one verse in a, in a text here. Well, actually, no, because that goes all throughout Scripture. Let's take a look and write these references down and go back to them and back to them and back to them because I need to do that every week as well. Psalm 18.6, you'll see it on the screen. In distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Psalm 34, 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The Lord heard and the Lord saved. Psalm 120, verse 1, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I called to the Lord and he answered me. He answered. And I love Lamentations 3, 55 to 57. It says this, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Pardon me. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea, love that, and you came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. Do not fear, loved one. Do not fear, I called on the Lord, he heard, and he answered. Because he knows. 
You see, calling out to God in the struggle is our first step to putting our faith in him as we go through it. Did you catch that? Calling out to God in the struggle is our first step of us putting our faith in him as we go through it. And the incredible truth is that we can trust that not only will God hear us, but he will also act on our behalf in his time and in his way. And and hear me, hear me on this. It may not look exactly like what we think we want it to look like. It may not happen exactly when we want it to happen but it will be good and it will be what we need. Guaranteed. Because he's a good, good father. Amen? God knows my cry. I must call out to him. And this then leads us to recognizing that when I'm in the trial, I must remember that God knows his promises. I must stand firm on them. God knows his promises. I must stand firm. On them. Look at verse 24. It says this. Verse 24 of chapter 2. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. You see, the word covenant there just means promise. God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And see, Abraham was a man who feared the Lord and was chosen by God as the one with whom God would make his promise to and carry it out through. And Isaac and Jacob were Abraham's son and grandson, respectively, through whom the covenant or promise would be carried through on until eventually Abraham's line led us to Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. God remembers his promises. Praise the Lord. And so you say, well, wait, what is this, what is this covenant promise that God's remembering here? Well, we see it in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And later on in Genesis, in Genesis 15 and 17, it's unpacked in greater detail. But the thrust of the promise is in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. You'll see it on the screen. And let's read that together. Now the Lord said to Abram, who is Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. First part of the promise. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's two parts to this promise, and we've highlighted them both on there. The first part is this, and I will make you a great nation. See, God was going to give the people of Israel their own land, their own geographical place that could be called their own. You don't think they were trying to remember that when they're in slavery in Egypt? He promised that. And then the second part, so that was for Israel. And then the second part there, it says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, through Abraham, both the people of Israel and ultimately all the people of the earth, that is you and me, would be blessed. Now think think about this for a moment. If you and I are Israelites right now, this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal. They had no doubt, they had no doubt heard the covenant promise passed down from generation to generation that God would make them a strong nation in a land of their own and would show his glory through them to the rest of the world. They, had, they were banking everything on this and they had heard it over and over, but we have to live in the text. Let's live in the text. Picture what must be going on right now in the minds of the Israelites. Don't forget This covenant promise right here, I will make you a great nation, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This was made 430 years before this moment right here. 430 years. Do you think, do you think that they would be questioning God as to whether he forgot about his promise to Abraham? You think they'd be questioning? Like, it's been 430 years. I don't know about you, but I'm like, if God makes a promise, I'm like, hey, Lord, that wisdom that you're promising from James 1, 5, that wisdom that you're promising, I need that like yesterday, okay? Come on, I'm going into a really hard situation here. Or, or, or God, yeah, you remember that whole thing? You say, fear not? Well, I'm feeling pretty afraid. Can you just uh, uh, do that right now? Uh, I, like, I like it when God answers right away. <laughs> right? This is 430 years. I mean, do you think that the people of Israel may have begun to doubt God's faithfulness to keep his promise to them as they literally watch generation after generation die off in front of them without the promise being fulfilled? Do you think they would have started to doubt and 
thinking, yeah, God promised that, uh, uh, but the reality of our situation here that we're seeing is telling us uh, that's not happening. That's not happening. And we better start fending for ourselves and taking matters into our own hands because God doesn't appear to be working. I fall into that trap all the time. Do you? Maybe just me? And you say, well, how can we fall into this mentality so easily? And my question would be, are you doing that today? Are you doing that today? Are you doubting what God has promised to those who put their faith and trust in him? His promises for that trial that you're facing right now, right where you're sitting, that hurt you're experiencing, that decision that you are facing, the sin that you're struggling with? Are you doubting God's promises? And would you know it if you were doubting them? And you say, well, wait a second, how do I, how do I know if I'm doubting them? Well, five key indicators I'm doubting God's promises. Five key indicators I'm doubting God's promises. Number one, I seek others first and not God. James 1.5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask and not doubt, and it will be given. James 1.5. You see, and when we start to doubt God's promises, we begin to seek out others who will validate. Don't you notice this? We start to seek out others who validate what we're feeling and begin to pursue the wisdom of man over the wisdom of God. We want people, oh yeah, you know what, yeah, that's really hard. Oh, you should do, do this, do this, do this, do that. Just take matters into your own hand. Oh yeah. I mean, and doesn't this lead, doesn't this lead us to such quickly to negativity? to self-despondency, oh, nothing's gonna change, I have no hope, I'm just, I've lost all the motivation. The grumbling, the complaining. I mean, it's true, misery loves company. Right? And this is so important that we start right here, that we call out to God first, because here's the reality, simple truth, what you call, what you put first will always order the rest. What you put first will always order the rest. And God promises that when we seek him through his word and prayer, no matter what we're facing, he will answer with the wisdom, strength, faith, and hope that we need. He will answer. Five indicators I'm doubting God's promises. Number two, I refuse to humble myself and repent. I refuse to humble myself and repent. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord and at the due time, he will lift you up. He will exalt you. You see, when we start to doubt God's promises, it leads us so quickly to hanging on to our own desires for what we want to see happen and privately pushing our own agenda, saying, I'm going ahead with this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm gonna stay here. I'm hurt. I'm doing what I want. They're the ones that are wrong. They come to me, and then I'll think about forgiving them. We start to push our own agenda, refusing to humble ourselves, refusing to repent. But here, loved ones, hear this. Hear this. If left unchecked, if left unchecked, the sin of pride will blind us to the destructive reality that it is creating. If left unchecked, the sin of pride in our heart will blind us to the destructive reality that it is creating. If I can exhort you in one thing today, it's this. There's such freedom in repentance. There's such freedom to getting low before our Savior and saying, I can't do this. I surrender it to you. I'm humbling myself. I'm coming under you. Whatever you want, Lord. There's such freedom there. But so many people don't get to the point. We want to do it ourselves. We're not standing firm on God's promise. And James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud. He's actually opposing the proud. But he gives grace upon grace to the humble. Isaiah 30, 18 says, he longs to be gracious to us. He longs to be gracious. Five indicators. Five indicators that we're beginning to doubt God's promises. Number one, I seek others out first and not God. Number two, 
I refuse to humble myself and repent. And number three, my thankfulness turns to complaining. My thankfulness turns to complaining. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, rejoice in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you. To rejoice in all circumstances. And when we start to doubt God's promises, our thankfulness becomes dependent. Notice this? Notice this? Our thankfulness starts to become dependent only on what we can see right in front of us and what our circumstances are. When we start to doubt God's promises, that's what our thankfulness starts to become dependent on. And we start to grumble, we start to complain, you notice this? And we start to get negative Oh, I wish I had this, and oh, I don't really like this, even though I've got this. Oh, I don't really like this. I don't like that. I wish God would do this instead. Meanwhile, we have this. Like, godliness with contentment is great gain. And as I, a question I want to ask us that I've been really challenged with again this week is this. Hear me, eyes up. I love the fact so many are taking notes. What a blessing. But I want to see your eyes for a moment because this is important. If if God never gave you anything else except the promise of eternal life with him, would that be enough for you? Would it? That's the litmus question. Are we doubting God's promise? You see, if God never gave you anything else but his promise of eternal life with him, would it be enough for you? No job, no children, no health improvements, no spouse, no GPA. If I could break that question down even smaller, I would say, is he enough for you? Is he enough for you? Hebrews 12, 28 says, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For those who've put their faith and trust in him, that is the greatest promise. And is that enough for you? That cannot be taken away. And I also challenge you in this, be careful before you answer that question. Be careful. Because he just might take you up on it. Is he enough for you? Five indicators I'm doubting God's promises. Number one, I seek others first and not God. Number two, I refuse to humble myself and repent. Number three, my thankfulness turns to complaining. Number four, uh, I refuse God's discipline and run from it. I refuse God's discipline and run from it. Hebrews 12, uh, 10b and 11 says this, but he, being God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful, but rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. See, when we start to doubt God's promises, our cry to God becomes, we start to doubt his promises, our cry becomes, Lord, change my circumstance. Change, get me out of this circumstance. Change it up, Lord. Instead of crying out to him, standing firm on his promise, and saying, Lord, change me in the circumstance. Whatever the cost to whatever the end, I'm coming under you in this, but change me through it. And it's taken me almost 36 years to start to tap into this beautiful truth and freedom-inducing truth in our hearts, and it is this. God's discipline is just one of many of God's gifts to us. It's his very kindness that leads us there to repentance. And I heard it said recently, this, you write this down, this is so powerful. It says, often the Lord will withhold what we want in order to produce in us what we need. Often the Lord will withhold what we want in order to produce in us what we need. His discipline will bear fruit for his glory and our good if we're willing to humble ourselves, come under it, and be trained by it. Lastly, five indicators I'm starting to doubt God's promises. Number one, I seek out others first before God. I refuse to humble myself and repent. 
My thankfulness turns to complaining. I refuse God's discipline and run from it. And number five, my fear begins to overcome my faith. My fear begins to overcome my faith. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Fear not, loved one. And when we start to doubt God's promises, don't you notice this? Anxiety, fear, and worry begin to manifest themselves in our minds and in our hearts. Why? What is the root of all of those things? Anxiety, fear, worry. The root is unbelief. It's unbelief. And it makes perfect sense because what's the root of faith? Belief in what we cannot see. Hebrews 11.1. 1. And as such, we begin to let our faith be determined. You ever notice this? You let our faith be determined by the size of the circumstance in front of us instead of letting it be determined by the size of our God who's Lord over it. You notice that? Oh, but the situation's too hard. My faith gets really small. Oh, the pain is too great. My faith gets really small. Listen, if I could sum all of this up for you in this one state, it would be this. Trust God's promises more than your perceptions. Trust God's promises more than our perceptions of a situation, of his perceived inaction. He's at work. And so how about you? How about me, loved ones? Are we standing firm? Are we standing firm on his promises? You see, the covenant that God made with Abraham wasn't just for the people of Israel. It was for you and me too, the families of the earth. God's promise to Abraham to bless the nations was fulfilled when God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth and die on the cross for you and me to pay the penalty for our sin. Look at John 3.16 on the screen. This This is the greatest promise of all time right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, here it is, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a promise. He remembers it. It can't be shaken. And this is the greatest promise and blessing we could ever have for all time. And it is available to every single person here today. Every one of the promises we see throughout God's word, hundreds of them, have one fulfillment point, Jesus Christ. All of them are, have their yes and amen in Jesus. And have you repented? Have you repented? This, this is the most important question of your life right here. Have you repented of your sin and trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Believing that he loves you. He loves you. And that his promise to save all those who call on his name will never be taken from you. Because here's the reality. If we are not standing firm on this promise we cannot stand firm at all. Where are we going to go? What else will we stand firm on? There is nothing else. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. There's nowhere else we can go. You see, when I'm in the trial, I must remember that God knows my cry. I must call out to him. God knows his promises. I must stand firm on them. And when we begin, loved ones, when we begin to stand firm on God's promises through Christ, we realize that God knows my struggle. Someone hear this this morning. God knows my struggle. I must embrace him. God knows my struggle. I must embrace him. Look at verse 25. So tender, so intimate, so powerful. Verse 25, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. See, God saw every detail of every part of what every Israelite was going through. There was not one thing he was unaware of. Just like right now in this room, the external circumstances that everybody could see and the deepest and darkest parts of our hearts that only he can see. He's completely aware. He created us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows. He knows. He knows. And you see there that Hebrew word for know when it says, and God knew, that's not a, oh yeah, you know, there, there's those Israelites again. Yeah, I know that guy. You know, I've seen him around a few times. Yeah, I know of him. I know of him. No, 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 no. The Hebrew word there for know means to know intimately 
to know deeply every part, every thought, every hurt, every tear. It's him saying, I know every single part of your struggle intimately, of what is causing you pain, of why you're discouraged, and I know it even better than you do. I love Psalm 56, 8. I've been ministered to so intimately with that this week. You'll see it on the screen. It says this. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Loved ones, those times you've cried out to the Lord and no one's been around but him to hear, He's got every one of your tears remembered in a bottle. He knows every sigh of discouragement. He knows every cry for help and he's recorded it. He remembers and he loves you. And he says, call out to me. I want to draw near to you because I know what you need and I will show you my glory if you trust me. Have you done that today? See, God knows what a God, what a Savior, that the very one who created all things knows us and the pain and struggles that we are going through so intimately, loved ones. Find hope in that today. Find hope in that today. And he isn't just a God who knows every intimate detail of who we are in the struggle. He's like, I just, yeah, I know what you're going through. Okay, he doesn't stop there. He's not just a God who knows intimately our pain or sin that we may feel enslaved to. He is a God who acts every single time we call on him. He's a God of action. And he will rush to meet us and draw near to us when we call out to him. And he will act in his time. He will act in his way. He will act for his glory. And he will act for nothing but our good and his glory. Because he's a good, good father. He loves you and he loves me. You see, God is attentive to you today, right where you're sitting. God's attentive to you. The question is are you embracing him? Are you embracing him? God sees you in that place right now. He knows exactly how you're feeling and he loves you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, pay the penalty for for your sin and meet you right where you are at. He knows, loved ones, stop running from him today. That's for someone here. Stop running. He knows. Where else are you gonna run? There's nowhere else to run. And you see, Jesus is the one we must embrace For apart from him, there's no hope. There's no hope apart from Jesus Christ. But in him, look at Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 on the screen and be encouraged. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Grace and help is available to you right now and his name is Jesus Christ. The question is, will you humble yourself before him and embrace him so he can draw near to you? He cannot bless pride. And because God knows in my time of need, I can draw near through Jesus Christ and I can embrace his love for me. I can embrace his love for me. I can embrace his goodness towards me. I can embrace his faithfulness to me. I can embrace his grace to strengthen and uphold me. I can embrace his intimacy and tenderness with me. I can embrace his forgiveness he offers me. Have you embraced him today? If not, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, oh, stop running. There's so much freedom in repentance. Let today be the day you say, Lord, I'm yours, whatever the cost to whatever the end, forgive my sin. It's available. He's attentive. And loved ones, 
take heart. God has never promised that on this side of eternity we will understand why he allows things to happen and why we go through things in our lives. He's never promised we'll understand on this side of heaven. But he does promise this. Ready? He knows. He knows what we're going through. And as we call out to him, stand firm on his promises and embrace him as we go through those struggles, those trials. He will come near to us. He will come near to us. Act on our behalf in his time and in his way for our good and his glory in our lives. Because he knows. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, you did not leave us on our own. Thank you that in you we can embrace forgiveness of sin. We can have you draw near to us with such intimacy, such tenderness, knowing that a bruised reed you will never break. You will never snuff out a smoldering wick. Father, you are attentive to us and I just say thank you that you're a good father. And I also confess, Lord, I need you. We need you. There's nowhere else we can go. Where else are we going to go? There's no other security. There's no other lasting fulfillment anywhere. Everything else is empty. We need you. It's you alone who can heal the pain and suffering. It's you alone who sees every tear that has been cried and remembers it and says, draw near to me today, loved one, and let me show you how I want to work on your behalf for your good because I love you. Lord, as your spirit moves in this place right now, I pray, I pray so much that, Lord, you would see a people who right where they're at, right in their seat right now, refuse to run away from you anymore and humble ourselves. Those things we wrote down, Lord, let's leave them at the foot of the cross, I pray. And Lord, you would meet with us and draw near to us and minister and there would be freedom and hope maybe for the first time in our lives from that struggle, that sin, that temptation. We need you. Lord, we need you. I pray specifically for those who've never trusted in you as their Savior that today this would be the echo of their heart to say there is a Savior who died for me. His name's Jesus Christ. I have no hope without him and I need you, Lord. And so as we sing this last song together, Lord, I pray it would be an echo and overflow of our hearts cry to you. And just as the cry of the Israelites was lifted up to you in that day, I pray this cry from our hearts will be lifted up to you. Lord, I need you. I need you. Come. Be glorified, Father. Have your way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.